Okay, so what we're going to do this afternoon, it shouldn't take too long, we're going to go over some definitions, what's important about your history and examination with respect to our diagnosis, um, how do we risk stratify patients, because that ultimately determines whether they come into the hospital or maybe we do our workup as an outpatient, what type of evaluation do people need, and very limited, we'll talk about management because uh, much of the more concerning part, we would defer to other services. And also we'll talk a little bit about complications. Okay, so first and foremost, I think it's very important that we recognize that all syncope involves loss of consciousness. You can have presyncope, but that hasn't gotten to the stage of syncope, but all syncope involves loss of consciousness. The reverse is not true. All loss of consciousness is not equal to syncope. So in a second, we're going to get uh, into the definitions a little bit, but I had a presentation this morning that I'll share with you. I had a 53-year-old woman uh, admitted to me this morning. Uh, she came in uh, over the past several days. She's had several episodes of, quote, dizziness, and per the intern's note, syncope. Uh, the first episode occurred, she was sitting down, and she noticed that she had uh, had some spinning sensation, some vertigo. She used the word dizziness, and just as a reminder, dizziness is a lay term. Try to always clarify what the patient means when they say dizziness. She, she had this dizziness that they clarified was actually a sensation of spinning, and she she got up and passed out. She did have a roommate, a housemate, that was present and said she had lost consciousness for about a minute. Uh, during, uh, after that episode, she was fully lucid when she awoke. She didn't have any episodes of tongue biting, uh, no twitching, anything like that. <clears throat> Paresthesias, tingling. She um, had another episode. After that one, she got up and walked to the bathroom and while walking to the bathroom, she started feeling lightheaded, noticed some palpitations, and again, she passed out. This time, she hit her head when she fell down. Um, after that, she had one more episode at home, at which time her roommate insisted she come to the hospital. She did have some vomiting after the second episode, and she did have some vague abdominal pain that went along with that. When we asked her some more questions, she actually had had symptoms of vertigo off and on for the preceding month, uh, which she had not sought care for. She has a variety of uh, past medical conditions, um, none of which are cardiac. She does have COPD. Um, she has a history of anxiety disorder. She's had a, a, a prior diagnosis of colon cancer in her past. She is on uh, a variety of CNS-altering medications. She's on tizanidine. She takes 800 of gabapentin three times a day. She takes venlafaxine, dicyclamine, um, takes Abilify. So those are some relevant things. And, oh, by the way, she did admit to, in January of this year, using IV heroin, but denies other substances. She has a relevant family history that her brother died at age 44 of an MI. Let's see. It's kind of the highlights. Her physical examination was pretty unremarkable. Um, orthostatics were obtained and were not uh, positive. And she had an EKG performed, which was unrevealing. Uh, she had a head CT. It didn't show any abnormalities. And lastly, she did have a tox screen that was positive for cocaine and opiates. So the picture can be a little bit cloudy. Hers is by no means the most cloudy, acute, brief loss of consciousness cases I've had, but just shows you there's a lot of stuff to tease out in some of these patients. So how do we know if we're dealing with syncope or some other cause of loss of consciousness? So first of all, let's start with the definition. The episode must be transient, usually less than a minute in duration. Our patient met that criteria. Um, 
if you have something like a simple mechanical fall or a drop attack, you don't lose consciousness. You just, all of a sudden, you're down. Um, as part of the syncope, they do lose postural tone, so they do fall. Um, it has spontaneous recovery, possibly impeded by bystanders who put the head back up. Okay. It is a result of global cerebral hypoperfusion. The cortex isn't getting globally enough blood flow. And some of the things that are in our differential, we often lump in as syncope, but they have different mechanisms. For example, seizures. It's not a perfusion abnormality. It's an electrical abnormality. It's not a TIA or a stroke because those are not global perfusion abnormalities. Those are localized perfusion abnormalities. So when we're talking about syncope, um, transient global hyperperfusion, self-limited normally, uh, spontaneous recovery. So we've already hit on some, some things that may come through the ER door that we're considering syncope, but they may have a non-syncopal event that's similar or partially mimics. So you can see here we've already talked about seizures. Um, some people have narcolepsy. Again, that's not a perfusion problem. TIA is kind of a warning harbinger for strokes, but uh, not for syncope. And vertigo is listed up here. It's not a syncopal event. Our patient had vertigo. Um, breath holding spells, that's particularly common in children uh, or the markedly less sophisticated. Um, some of our COPD patients may have hypoxia or hypercapnia that can also resemble syncope but it's an oxygenation or an excess uh, carbon dioxide in the blood. Intoxication, we never see that here, so we'll just skip that one. <laughs> okay, so there are two main classes uh, that we break syncope into. Is it neurocardiogenic or is it cardiac syncope? Um, the three big types that we talk about with neurocardiogenic are the classic vasovagal, um, the typical faint. We'll go into that a little bit more. There are those who have carotid sinus uh, sensitivities, and there are certain things that can provoke that in individuals. Orthostatic hypotension falls under this category as well, and we will see that quite frequently. Cardiac syncope. Um, there are two main um, classes or categories we talk about with that, and there are a few rare causes that are lumped under the cardiac syncope. And I think one of the things to think about with cardiac syncope, it's kind of like a TIA. A TIA is a warning that a stroke might be imminent. Um, a cardiac syncope might mean a catastrophic cardiac event, such as cardiac death, may be imminent. So it's something that we do want to uh, tease out what category the patient has uh, to determine what our next step will be. Okay, as we said... The classic faint is a neurocardiogenic. Um, it is a clinical diagnosis. You ask the right type of questions, which we'll get into. The reason it happens is they have a combination of a reflex withdrawal of sympathetic tone, so your vascular bed dilates, all the blood pools in your feet, while you simultaneously have increase in your vagal tone, which slows your heart rate. Therefore, no blood going up to the brain, down you go. Okay, So that's the classic. Uh, carotid sinus syncope is mechanical manipulation uh, of your carotid bodies that, that can alter, again, your sympathetic and parasympathetic tone. I remember I had one elderly gentleman sitting at the kitchen table playing Scrabble and doing the hands under the chin kind of thing, and down he went. So mechanical uh, stimulation there. Uh, and then orthostatic hypotension, which you all are familiar with. So cardiac syncope. Arrhythmias are the most common uh, type of cardiac syncope versus, you know, your classic vasovagal being the most common neurogenic and most common overall of syncope. So the arrhythmias can be of a wide variety, bradyarrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias. Um, the patient can have structural disease uh, that impedes the cardiac output, subsequently reducing CNS perfusion. So it could be valvular, uh, could have cardiac tumors, they could have uh, cardiac tamponade, uh, various cardiomyopathies with, you know, such reduced ejection fraction that they are not perfusing, um, especially if they have 
concomitant arrhythmias with that, uh, obstructive cardiomyopathies. And also listed under the cardiac syncopes, and we used to say, oh, we'll never see this, but uh, I have actually had a patient with a saddle pulmonary embolism who presented with syncope. And what was fascinating about him is that he really didn't require any oxygen. It was truly amazing how such a humongous uh, presenting clot could be so benign, but he presented with syncope. Uh, rarely a patient with uh, cardiac ischemia can present that way. Aortic dissection, subclavian steel, they're working overhead, and, and so that's a situation you want to ask, what were they doing when they passed out? Uh, that, again, takes the brain's blood flow away, and down they go. Okay. One of the things that you want to think about when you're talking about syncope is what is the age of your patient? Because the cardiogenic, uh, the neurocardiogenic type of syncope is the most common, my porn is not working, is the most common across all age spectrums, but it goes from, you know, 95% in the under 40 crowd, gradually decreasing in prevalence to when you're in the over 40 crowd, it only accounts for about 50% of the uh, cases of syncope. And during that gradually increasing age time period, you will see that orthostatic hypotension goes up significantly, as does um, arrhythmias, and then lastly, cardiac structural disease. Those all have a much more important role uh, in the etiology of syncope in the patient who is over 60 years of age. So... What do we do when this person comes in to our office, to the emergency department, to our night float team? Uh, a tailored but thorough history and physical can get you, I, this says one-third to two-thirds. I think quite on, honestly it's probably at least two-thirds if you've had an opportunity to get the right type of history mostly and to a lesser degree your physical examination. It helps you with your risk stratification, and we'll go into some of that. Witnesses, such in the patient that I presented, um, are very helpful when you do not have witnesses to ask. It uh, truly does make it very difficult to distinguish is it syncope versus some other uh, type of loss of consciousness. All patients, especially when you get into that older than 60 crowd, you definitely want to know about their medications. In my patient, I listed about five, four, five neuroactive medications um, on, on her concern list. Some of them can be things like diuretics or is the patient uh, becoming volume depleted because we've put them on diuretics? Have they uh, gotten a new blood pressure medicine? So the timing, additions of new medications can also help tease out, oh, this is the culprit, this is the new one on the back, they're on anticholinergic now, they weren't before, so a variety of things. Family history is very important. We do know that there are arrhythmic events that run in families, prolonged QT syndrome, that sort of thing. Um, so you definitely want to ask about that. Also can be structural heart disease associated with sudden death like uh, Marfan syndrome, so a variety of things. So you want to ask about uh, family history, particularly with respect to cardiac deaths and sudden in particular. So I said, our patient had a 44-year-old brother die from a myocardial infarction. We don't know any more details than that, but that's rather young. Um, you always want to know, do they have any specific underlying medical problems? Because there can be risk factors for orthostatic hypotension. They have Crohn's disease, and they've just had a flare, and they've been passing a lot of bloody stools for the past week. Well, you know, they may be profoundly anemic, and that would explain their syncope. So you, you need to explore those type of uh, underlying pathologies as well. In your history, to tease out whether it's syncopes, we're going to go over the five P's that you should try to answer. Was there a prodrome? Were there precipitants? What position was the patient in? Did they have palpitations? Did they have post-event symptoms? And I'm going to go through each of these. So with the prodrome of lightheadedness, quote, dizziness, 
blurred vision, um, that is very suggestive of the neurocardiogenic or vasovagal symptom, syncope, or orthostatic hypotension as uh, the cause. Uh, if they had nausea, sweating, or abdominal pain before the event, also that tends to be supportive of neurocardiogenic. If they were asymptomatic, it was sudden, no warning. In older adults, that still could be the vasovagal type of presentation, but it is more concerning for the possibility of cardiac syncope. So prodrome, you want to know what happened before the loss of consciousness episode. Were there any precipitating associated conditions? Were they in a warm, hot, crowded environment? Were they in pain? Were they distraught, emotionally upset? Um, had they recently been exercising, not currently, but recently been exercising? So anything that would support also a diagnosis of dehydration. Um, those type of things support vasovagal. Also, under the right circumstances, they support orthostatic hypotension. There are certain situational type of syncopes that occur with vagal tone being increased, particularly in the elderly. It can be coughing, lack laughing, micturition, defecation, even eating. So you want to find out what was going on. Uh, that's called situational syncope. If there are associated head movements, right or left, uh, wearing tight collars, did it happen while they were shaving? Or as I told you, a guy sitting on the table with his hands, fists underneath his, his chin. Uh, that suggests that they have a carotid sinus uh, etiology for their syncope. If they were actively exercising or there was no identifiable precipitant, that's very concerning for the possibility of structural heart disease or arrhythmia as the cause of their syncope. So prodrome, precipitants, position. What position were they in? Had they been standing for a prolonged period of time? Like when you're first standing in the operating room holding retractors stuck behind somebody's arm, you know, and you're getting tired of that. So you get lightheaded from prolonged standing, and especially if you're in a restricted position. Um, also could be orthostasis. Does it happen with sudden changes in posture? And usually what they're meaning is from supine or sitting upright rather than the opposite direction. That supports a diagnosis of orthostatic hypotension. If the syncope occurs while they are actually supine, Again, that suggests cardiac, arrhythmias, structural. So prodrome, precipitants, position, palpitation. Palpitations always makes you think that arrhythmias are present. Our patient had palpitations during part of her episodes, as well as orthostatic position change type of stuff. All right. So this is uh, an area I'm not sure we dwell on as much, a little bit, but what was happening in the immediate post loss of consciousness period to see if that can help tease uh, was this truly syncope or not. If they had immediate, complete cognitive recovery that is consistent with syncope of any of the types, all right? Um, if they had nausea, vomiting, and fatigue, that kind of supports the neurocardiogenic. If Immediately after the event, they look pale, they're sweating. That is more suggestive of syncope. In contrast, if they have some evidence of cyanosis, that is more suggestive that a seizure was the cause of the loss of consciousness. This one part can be a little bit tricky, the movements of a patient. It is not unusual to have four to six beats of myoclonic jerking with true syncope. That in and of itself does not mean a seizure, so, but it's a very brief, happens pretty much right at the onset of the event and when they've hit the ground, uh, the myoclonic jerks. That can be, again, syncope of any type, but if it's more prolonged, uh, rhythmic jerking, abnormal posturing, uh, uh, if they had prodromal lip smacking or anything before the event, those things support uh, the seizure. Uh, a seizure was the, the likelihood. Uh, eyes open don't help us a whole lot right after because either a seizure or syncope, they can do that. Um, however, if they stay prolonged but they appear to be 
conscious. There may be some psychogenic component there, underlying psychiatric pseudo seizure kind of stuff going on. And of course, mental status. We already talked about the immediate complete recovery that goes along with syncope, uh, but if they have prolonged confusion, if they have retrograde amnesia that is more consistent with seizure, um, if it's transient, they just briefly were disoriented, uh, that suggests the neurally mediated. And then last, lastly, uh, it isn't unusual for the older to be a little bit amnestic of the event. So this can be very helpful, but what happens when your patient passed out? Oh, by the way, they hit their head pretty significantly on the way down. I mean, I, I had a person do that, hit his head on a concrete floor from standing to concrete. So, Again, these are helpful, but the patients don't always come with a clean picture for you. So just have to look for whatever supporting details that you can. So on your physical examination, uh, you're looking for serious other underlying comorbidities, but you definitely have to get your vital signs. Do they have at baseline bradycardia, tachycardia? You always want to get your orthostatic Blood pressure checks, I prefer you do them yourself, if humanly possible. Down in the ER, they're hooked up to monitors, they're hooked up to blood pressure, take a student or somebody, and they're to catch them when they want to fall again. Uh, that is very important in the syncope workup. Uh, you want to listen to the carotid arteries, not for breweries, because you're not trying to do a stroke workup. You're listening for referred murmurs, right? that might suggest that the patient has an obstructive uh, outflow. Um, clearly and similarly, I'm not good at it myself, but you're, you're palpating to see the rise in the upstroke as well. Again, looking for valvular or subvalvular uh, aortic uh, uh, obstruction. You want to focus on heart and lung, abdomen. Do they have an aneurysm that you can feel, that sort of stuff? Clearly, anytime somebody said brain failure, they passed out, you need to do and document an appropriate neurological examination to make sure that it isn't a stroke pathway or a TIA or something else rather than syncope. Um, I haven't actually done this carotid sinus massage, but if you're going to do it, make sure the patient is on telemetry. Um, you do want to avoid it under specific circumstances. Those patients who have had uh, recent MIs or known breweries, I guess that's the other reason to listen. If you're going to do a carotid ar artery massage, uh, you want to make sure you're not hearing a brewery before you do that. Um, and you might consider in patients older than 40 who have already had uh, initial syncope workup that has been negative. So here's kind of a flow chart, and we'll get into some of this a little bit more. So you have your person who's come in. They've had a transient loss of consciousness. You're thinking, is it syncope? Is it not? So we begin our initial evaluation, which is history and physical. And we'll go into some other things. Um, if you are identifying what you think is a non-syncopal cause, you go down that pathway, confirm, consult as needed, treat appropriately, and give them another diagnosis. If you're still suspecting syncope, you have a certain diagnosis. We had one in the ER just a little bit ago. Came in, vomiting diarrhea, orthostatic, passed out, gave him fluids, got better, sent home. Okay, so that's a certain diagnosis. You had an etiology, you know, totally consistent, responded to treatment. But we have a lot, like our patient, who have an uncertain diagnosis. And we really want to know, is it safe to send them home? Do I need to do something now? Um, what really is the danger of sending them? Why do I have to keep them in the hospital? So we're going to stratify low risk, single or rare, um, rare syncope, you know, younger people, stress, anxiety, they don't get admitted, they don't get worked up like this. Uh, if they are low risk but recurrent, you might do some additional workup. Uh, we typically will do an EKG and look at that and also uh, appropriate cardiac or neurally mediated tests um, if we need. But we're really in the hospital particularly focusing on, on who is higher risk and what kind of evaluation do they need and what kind of treatment. Okay. So in general, uh, neurocardiogenic and orthostatic syncope 
are relatively benign. However, you know, you've got an elderly frail population, even those, quote, benign uh, episodes can be associated with some significant harms uh, from the loss of consciousness and the subsequent gravity happening and hitting the floor or whatever. Um, so those people, especially if they're at risk for recurrent episodes of trauma, not benign from that point of view. Uh, orthostatic hypotension, though, I think is important for us to recognize. There is an associated twofold increase in their mortality uh, attributable to the underlying causes of their orthostatic hypotension. So it's not the syncope itself, it's why are they orthostatic. Cardiac causes have a high mortality across all of the ages. So this is what we're trying to pick out of those who are presenting, who has the high risk profile. So we admit to the hospital anyone that we think has severe structural abnormality or coronary disease with known low ejection fraction, um, if they have important severe comorbidities such as anemia, severe electrolyte disturbances that may promote arrhythmias, or any suggestion that we have that they might have had an arrhythmic syncope, like from taking too much cocaine or something. Okay. It happens. Okay. So uh, we know that with cardiac syncope, uh, the six-month mortality is greater than 10% from the underlying illness. Okay. So we really need to think and ask these questions, did they have exertional or supine syncope? Uh, did they have palpitations before the event? Did they have family history of sudden death? Do we have evidence that they are having non-sustained VTAC? Do they have baseline EKG abnormalities? And do they have other reasons such as chest pain, heart failure, uh, syncope without warning, uh, and that sort of stuff? that they should at least come in for observation so that we can see what's going on. So there are actually some guidelines in, in terms of uh, evaluating a, a patient's risk for cardiac syncope, which is the, the one we're more concerned about. You can add and subtract points, as we've already hit some of the highlights. Did they have palpitations? Do they have known heart disease or abnormal EKG? You gets points for that. Did they have the event during exercise or while supine? Those all add points to uh, support the idea of cardiac syncope, but we can subtract points if they had other predisposing factors. They were orthostatic. They were dehydrated from their, their GI illness. Uh, they had uh, uh, autonomic prodome, that you know, cool, clammy, nausea, vomiting kind of sensation beforehand. One of the things that they have looked at, they did a, uh, a this was an ER study, they compared, uh, they got a cohort and then they validated this. And they found that over approximately two years of follow-up, uh, people 18 years and older who presented for this, if they had a score of over three or over, um, they had a mortality of 17 to 21%. So significant. So we take syncope seriously, not that other causes of loss of consciousness may not be important, but this needs to be uh, kept in the back of your mind every time you want to send somebody out from the ER who presents with syncope. Are you confident that they don't have cardiac syncope? <clears throat> Before I go over the usual testing, I'm going to go over the usual unnecessary testing for syncope. A head CT, not usually needed except for I told you the cases. Some patients with syncope sustain some significant closed head injuries from the actual mechanical fall. We don't need to look for carotid artery disease because that is not syncope if you're worried that they have a TIA and they are at risk for stroke and you want to do the Doppler, carotid Dopplers for that purpose, that's fine. But if you're calling it syncope, it is not a carotid artery obstruction problem. We normally don't need an EEG. Uh, in the absence of chest pain, acute coronary syndrome type of uh, symptoms, you don't need to get cardiac enzymes. Tilt tables um, are 
normally not used unless the patient has recurrent episodes of syncope that uh, we're having difficulty establishing in etiology, but particularly if they are in high-risk occupations, you don't want your bus driver, your pilot, your whatever uh, to be passing out, so they may get some additional. It can be helpful in patients that you think might have some underlying uh, uh, psychiatric or neurologic forms uh, to cause this. Okay. Although, well, I'll talk about it. The, the, the four main diagnostic categories that we talk about when we're talking about uh, working up syncope is the electrocardiogram, prolonged EKG monitoring, an echocardiogram, and EP studies. All right. So the electrocardiogram we use uh, mostly for risk stratification, and the others we'll talk about a little bit more. The EKG is available in every ER, so it's widely available, and it is low cost, and it is non-invasive. Does that make it a good test? No, it does not. However, because it's not very sensitive, it is not sensitive at all. But if you find abnormalities on there, it is specific, okay? If you find evidence of uh, arrhythmias, conduction abnormalities, prior MIs, etc., so it can be specific, but it is not sensitive. So you can't necessarily use that to decide whether to admit someone or not. Um, it may help us go down the pathway of what tests to do next. If you think that there is uh, arrhythmias and you don't catch it while they're in the hospital, prolonged EKG monitoring can be very helpful for that. Uh, certain people with structural heart disease uh, uh, can still get arrhythmias and you need this. We already talked about the sudden uh, death. I have had uh, patients who have had normal EKGs and not until they've had additional like EP study, I mean, uh, prolonged monitoring, do you see the, uh, the uh, frequency of arrhythmias that pop up? So you can sort of see who we want to get prolonged EKG monitoring for. Um, if you've already stratified them that you think they have cardiac syncope, they're going to come in at least under observation for inpatient telemetry. You're going to look and see if you find anything. If you don't find anything, you're still suspicious. You can't keep them in the hospital forever, so you have to decide, do they need any additional uh, evaluation for arrhythmias? Uh, if their symptoms are frequent enough, you can order just the routine variety halter monitoring for 24 or 48 hours. Um, they have their little pack and monitor leads and that sort of stuff. Um, however, if their symptoms are not very frequent, you are not going to detect it and the monitor will be turned back in and it will be worthless. So for less frequent uh, episodes of syncope, there are uh, mostly three types of event recorders and they're triggered by the patients. There's an a, loop, a looping type that will catch several seconds beforehand. There's a post-symptom event recorder. Uh, it doesn't pick up uh, the prior, uh, from a patient's point of view, I guess it doesn't have all the leads and stuff stuck on you, so it's more tolerable if you're out in the world for a long time with, you know, electrodes coming off of you. Lastly, for somebody who's quite serious, I guess they can even put an implantable loop recorder, and I don't know when they would choose to do that or a patient would agree to that, uh, especially if it wasn't attached with an intervention like a defibrillator. So, anyway... Echocardiogram, and that is probably outside of your EKG is the most common test that's going to help you in someone that you're worried about having cardiac syncope. You're going to look for your valvular disease as your outflow obstruction, unsuspected uh, tumors such as atriomyxomas, that sort of stuff. Um, hopefully we would suspect if they had tamponade as the cause, but you could pick that up. Uh, similarly with an, an aortic dissection, hopefully they would have given us a few symptoms that might get us down that. And occasionally you can see uh, congenital anomalies of the coronary arteries, which uh, may actually cause acute ischemia, but I have seen that more in the pediatric population than I have seen it in the adult population. And the last diagnostic study we talk about is who should get an electrophysiological study. People who have ischemic heart disease, um, 
particularly if the initial evaluation suggests that they might have an arrhythmia. Um, unless, if they have an indication already for a defibrillator, they may not do the EP, they may just do the defibrillator. Um, it should be considered in people uh, with bundle branch block if we haven't yet gotten their diagnosis. Again, you're looking for uh, an indication for the treatment that follows that. And there's certain selected cases, uh, patients that have conditions that are associated with high risk of arrhythmias. And again, the high risk occupations here. If a normal EP study gets somebody cleared so they can go back to work, that can be a benefit. Okay, so just very briefly on management. Obviously, uh, neurocardiogenic, uh, one of the things that we want to do is what they call isometric counter pressure maneuvers. So you want to have them do things that will increase the tone, the hand squeezing, the leg crossing, muscle tensing to try to uh, return, increase the venous return. Back in the day, not that far back, uh, they used to say beta blockers were the treatment. That is no longer recommended. So, uh, but you, these patients, remember, often have the prodrome, so they can tell it's coming on. So you, if you can teach them the tools, besides obviously getting to a safe place, uh, uh, they may be able to prevent the syncope from happening. Orthostatic hypotension, whenever possible, clearly you want to reverse that with fluids, what have you, reduction of blood pressure medicines, diuretics, that sort of thing. Compression stockings. And here in the hospital, you'll see we have the knee-high ones, which are very poorly fitted and often not the greatest. But if you have someone who has, say, a shy dragger or something, you really want to get the thigh-high compression stockings to get even more venous return if you can. And you might have to use medications such as uh, metadrine or uh, fludrocortisone for those patients who we can't, in other ways, keep their blood pressure. Uh, um, for carotid... Uh, Sinus hypersensitivity, they need a pacemaker. Uh, a dual chamber permanent pacemaker is what uh, will assist them the most. Okay. So complications, I um, have hit on this, uh, risk of injury. Major morbidity, including fractures, are elderly people who have a higher incidence of you know, arrhythmias and, and uh, structural cardiac. They're going to have a hip fracture, and, and that in and of itself will also increase their mortality. So... Uh, uh, motor vehicle accidents in 6% six, six of the time can be related to this. Major lacerations, bruises, sprained ankles. Um, and it definitely, for patients who have this um, on a more than once occasion, it can compromise their quality of life. It may influence what job uh, careers they can have. It can be bothersome enough that it can lead to depression. It definitely has implications for driving, and I will tell you those depend on what state you are in. If we have, for example, seizures, how many of you guys know how long uh, a person has to abstain from driving in the state of Kentucky, according to the law, after a seizure? Hmm? I'm hearing a couple. Uh, three? Three months? Is that the same everywhere? No. Uh, in Illinois, it's six months. You know, in Indiana, they don't have anything on record. So if you want to have a seizure, live in Indiana if you want to have seizures and drive. Um, so anyway, so you need to be aware of those sort of things that it has implications. So, all right. So the things that I want you to remember is that not all loss of consciousness, even brief loss of consciousness, is syncope. The reason we care about syncope is particularly if it's cardiac, it has a high associated mortality rate, anywhere from 10 to 20% over the next six months to two years. Know your five Ps when you're taking your history. Always review medications and their comorbidities to determine whether that by itself from a risk stratification point determines whether they need to come in, whether workup can be continued as an outpatient. Um, we've already hit that. And lastly, uh, even non-cardiac syncope, your, your vasovagal neurocardiogenic type, 
can have significant consequences and, and you know, orthostatic hypotension probably as the cause of syncope is one of the things that we see you know, in our elderly patients a great deal uh, that have major complications 